we're going to start out with our EE First Five this morning, and I'm uh, really uh, pleased to um, introduce Jana George from the Interior Region Housing Authority. Uh, Jana lives in Fairbanks with her family and joined IRHA in 2009 as a planning specialist, um, and she quickly showed showed to be a very inspirational leader, and she earned her spot as a CEO in April of 2014. Uh, prior to joining IRHA, uh, Jana worked for Cook Island Tribal Council, assisting the homeless population with housing and resources. She has over 10 years of management experience working with diverse populations all over Alaska, including remote areas. She brings many years of, work, uh, of experience working with tribes and is committed to excellence for the people that she serves. So please help me welcome uh, uh, Jana George. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, good morning, everybody. All right, we got a big crowd here. Well, uh, like Sarah said, my name is Jana George, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Interior Regional Housing Authority. IRHA is the tribally designated housing entity for 29 villages in the Fairbanks area. This past year, we had the pleasure of working in partnership, excuse me, of working in partnership with some of the most amazing staff from the Alaska Energy Authority, uh, the Minto Tribal Council, and Tanana Chiefs Conference. Um, this past weekend, IRHA and uh, DOE traveled to the community of Minto. Minto is a community of about 220 people, and they are uh, located in the Minto Flats area. They are along the Talvana River, and when you go to Minto, you'll realize that the Lakeview Lodge is truly the heartbeat of Minto. The lodge houses many different programs in Minto, everywhere from the school lunch program to el the elders' nutrition programs, all tribal operations, and anything else that you could think of in the community that might need a space. Uh, the lodge was constructed during the era of cheap housing. Uh, when this was project first was taking off, uh, operating costs and energy costs were not even, not even an issue. Just getting the project going itself and getting this lodge built was one of their main missions, and that was their primary concern. Since the construction of the Lakeview Lodge, uh, energy costs have rivet, uh, risen four to five hundred percent. And so the Minto Tribal Council was in dire straits trying to figure out how are we going to keep this building operating? How are we going to keep the heartbeat of our community going? They were dealing with a few problems. Um, some of their problems was that there was no historical energy use data. The building was very poorly insulated, and the tribe, whoops, I just forgot, I'm not even putting your pictures here. <laughs> I don't even know how to use this thing. Can you help me with that? Oh, there's a time again. <laughs> okay, right on. And it's going to keep going? Okay. Um, so this year we were able to take a look at how we could help. Um, in April of 2013, an outside agency approached the Minto Tribal Council. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be moving. Approached the Minto Tribal Council, and they had a one-size-fit-all. We're going to fix all of your energy needs. Needs, and the Minto Tribal Council was sold on that. In May of 2013. Tanana Chiefs Conference, Interior Regional Housing Authority, and the Alaska Energy Authority got involved and suggested a different path. The path that they chose to approach Minto Council with was energy efficiency first. Why put all this money into the biomass system if it was just going to be going out leaky windows, leaky doors, and that? <clears throat> so before investing in this new biomass, we went ahead and applied for the start grant. Minto was, Min <laughs> these are like supposed to be changing. <laughs> um, Minto was awarded a $250,000 start grant and that was dedicated to energy efficient uh, improvements. Also, the Renewable Energy Fund Round 7 grant from AEA for a biomass was given on the condition that they would make energy approved energy efficient measures. 
Minto's commitment to the energy efficient improvements to the lodge through the START grant and through the Rural Energy Fund helped them win a $200,000 Village Energy Efficiency Program, also known as VEEP. In the fall of 2013, to do the energy efficient improvements to the firehouse. Right here we have Bessie Titus, she's the tribal administrator. Uh, this one lady here probably wears 45 different caps. She runs everything from the tribal operations to the school lunch program, and it's like that in a lot of our communities where one person is wearing many different hats. And so we were able to go out there um, visit the site with the Department of Energy. I'd like to thank Pilar Thomas for, and Gibby for going out there and just hitting the road with us and really seeing what it's like to travel to these communities. Um, right here is a picture of the lodge prior to doing uh, our energy efficient updates. And then we have some photos here at, during construction. This is the IRHA staff here. This is a little bit, Oh yeah, thank you. Um, out here, we went ahead and we added quite a bit more insulation. Oop. I think there's a couple more pictures in there. And this is the fire hall that the VEAT project will be assisting. And so I just wanted to just tell everybody what an amazing program the START grant is and thank everybody from the Alaska Energy Authority working with the community of Minto and everything that had to get put together. Um, I'd also like to recognize my staff. They do a, quite the amazing job that we get out there. We do community planning and offer just a variety of different services. So if I could have my IRHA staff stand up and just wave at everybody here. I, I have with me Kimberly Carlo. She's the chief operating officer. I have Harold Atla. He's our construction manager. I have Steve Minima, he's our electrical administrator. And then right here in front of me is my executive assistant, <laughs> Christine Cooper. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, have a great day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jana. It's, it's always a pleasure to hear from uh, the experiences of the, of the programs uh, uh, that uh, we are a part of and uh, the communities and the organizations that uh, really make those uh, projects and programs a success. So uh, moving on to what we're going to talk about this morning, um, we wanted to give an update on some of the uh, larger projects in the state that we're working on. Sometimes, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a, a lot of attention uh, either during the legislative session with respect to um, large projects um, and although this is a rural energy conference, you know, we wanted to make sure that, that you know, there is a statewide perspective on these projects. Um, we have, a, you know, a natural gas pipeline, the Susitna Watana Hydro Project, and the Interior Energy Project that are key components to long-term stable energy supply for Alaskans. Uh, you know, these projects have uh, some complementary um, aspects to them. They work together to provide energy stability. The Interior Energy Project is working on expanding the distribution system and bringing natural gas to Fairbanks really to ready, ready it for um, a natural gas pipeline. So the natural gas pipeline is going to provide um, Alaskans with uh, efficient and affordable heating source um, and, the, and a gas supply while, while also providing uh, export revenues back to this, back to this state. And so um, I think it's, it's, it's real important that we that we um, recognize that. I know there's been a lot of discussions over the years with respect to the advancement of a large pipeline. Um, and I'm real excited that we're able to provide um, an opportunity at this conference to give an update on that. Um, and Susit and Watana Hydro, Hydro will provide stable and clean electricity for 100 plus years. Um, you know, a couple of things on these projects that the, uh, none of these projects are intended to be completely funded by general fund dollars. These projects, um, all are expected to include a mix of some general fund, uh, general fund dollars for development, but really are looking at private investments and a mix of financing packages. Um, affordable energy, as folks know, in rural Alaska, in the entire, the entire state, um, and in the entire United States, that affordable energy is really a building block for healthy communities and business environments. You need long-term stability when making investment decisions. 
So commercial, uh, the commercial and industrial sectors, including LNG facilities, require long, large quantities of affordable energy. So Sit and Hydro can provide that type of long and affordable energy sor source to support um, infrastructure and resource development. And um, really to bring it home through, you know, why we're talking about this at the, at the Rural Energy Conference is really all Alaskans are intended to benefit from, from these projects. The legislature has been very, very um, strategic in how they, how they address some of these large projects. And this has been historically too, where, you know, the, in, for the, the AKLNG project, uh, the legislature created a rural infrastructure fund that would be based upon the revenue coming in from a, a pipeline. Um, and as you've heard through this conference um, with folks from AEA, we've discussed the Alaska Affordable Energy Strategy, which is a component of that legislation that really uh, pulls pulls the issues in and ties it to um, ties it to f folks that live in areas that may not have a direct benefit of the pipeline, but how would folks have an indirect benefit of the pipeline. And so we're real proud of the fact that um, AEA is the, the agency really uh, responsible for, for working with folks, um, many in this room, uh, to discuss the, plan the planning for that. So, and, and also, you know, affordable electrical prices in the rail belt also maximizes PCE benefits. And when the PCE program was developed, that was a key component of that program, was it was, a, it was an opportunity for when, when Lauren when, um, when the state was investing in some larger um, infrastructure projects, um, they, there was a need to make sure that there was a, 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 an emphasis on the PCE program uh, to be developed to really take, take, um, take care of the areas where you cannot have necessarily the economies of scale of, of those large projects, but how would there be, be a connection? And they did, in the formula, of course, connect um, rail belt prices and actually um, Juno, Juno, Fairbanks, and Anchorage prices to the PCE formula. So in many respects, when the, um, the gas line was developed, uh, the legislation was uh, discussed this past year, the legislature also was looking for opportunities to tie the indirect, um, indirect communities or providing benefits indirectly to communities that may not directly benefit from the pipeline. Um, so with that, I'm really pleased to um, announce our um, our speakers. We're going to start with uh, uh, Gene Terrio. He's um, apparently been announced several times and um, introduced uh, several times during the conference, so I'm not going to um, mention too much in his um, biography, but I do want to say that, you know, since joining, and even before joining AEA, you know, the one thing that um, my experience as the executive director when we there's um, conversations going on about um, energy policy and planning. Um, there is always a, a question of how how is that being addressed? We need someone that has kind of a, a perspective on on the, on that. We knew that AEA was the right agency to do it, but we needed we needed someone kind of in to really kind of take on the policy and planning portion of it. So I'm real pleased that um, you know any time that those conversations happen before Gene joined AEA, his name always came to the top of the list. And so um, I was real excited that we were able to um, bring Gene. Um, into the AEA fold, and it's been a pleasure uh, working with him uh, in his position on this. So please help me welcome Gene. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to give an update on the, uh, the LNG project, uh, the Interior Energy Project. Uh, this uh, schematic just gives you a, an idea of the different components uh, of the project. You can see here uh, there is a north slope plant uh, where the raw gas comes in off of one of the fuel gas lines, uh, is liquefied, has to be put into uh, storage tanks uh, before it is then loaded into special, um, special LNG trailers uh, brought down the, the Dalton Highway uh, into the interior. Again, that cryogenic uh, liquid, it's minus 260 or minus 262 degrees, uh, is then put into specialized storage uh, before it is then taken out, warmed up so it's back in a gaseous state, and then put into a distribution system that then can go to private residential uh, dwellings and also for industrial use. 
Uh, in addition, if you have a, a large industrial user, uh, they may have the capability of drawing the LNG right out of the tank and putting that to good use in an industrial um, process. And uh, that actually is what Golden Valley Electric uh, plans to do, or they have the capability if the uh, LNG is uh, sited out in North Pole or some of the LNG storage, they would be able to draw it out, uh, regasify it, and, and put it right into one of their turbines in North Pole, uh, which a number of years ago when it was built, the idea was that it would be converted from liquid fuel, a naphtha fuel, uh, into uh, natural gas at some time. So it, it uh, has the ability of being easily converted to uh, natural gas. Uh, Golden Valley then wouldn't really need the, the, to use a distribution system. That distribution system um, is more for residential use and, and small air, smaller industrial use. Uh, the goals of the, the IEP, the Interior Energy Project, were to uh, deliver the product into the interior at the lowest cost possible. Uh, for as many Alaska customers as possible and as soon as possible. There was a time element. But any of you that have worked projects, you know that, yes, you can hurry your project up, but if you do that, the cost of the project goes up. Uh, so as Ada has worked with private uh, proponents on, on this infrastructure, they have those two things to keep in balance. You know, we want it uh, to develop it as, as quickly as we can, but we are also focused on the price. So, so trying to keep those two things in balance are, are very important. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the financing package that the governor introduced a couple of years ago. Uh, and then as it went through the, uh, the legislative process, there were some modifications. You could see $125 million deposit into the SETS fund. That was a, a special infrastructure fund that was created by the legislature, I think it was the previous year, to this financing package being introduced for ADA, who is a sister uh, agency of AEA, uh, to, to be able to make investments in energy infrastructure specifically. Uh, ADA is a, an investment uh, a tool or entity of the state. They make investments to spur economic activity, economic development. And what the legislature wanted to do was also give them a particular fund and some tools to uh, invest that fund specifically in energy infrastructure. Uh, when the governor uh, decided to move forward with offering a financing package, rather than draw all of the money uh, out of that SETS fund, he actually endowed it, the fund with an additional $125 million for ADA to specifically consider uh, investment or, or loaning out money for this interior energy project. And so that's the $125 million. In addition, the governor uh, had a capital appropriation of $50 million. You can see the total here on this middle block is 57.5, indicating that as it went through the legislative process, the legislature actually bumped that capital um, general fund uh, component up to $57.5 million. Again, those are funds for ADA to be able to place somewhere in this blend of infrastructure where they believe it, it benefits the project the most. Those invested dollars, there's no requirement that they get, um, they generate a return to the state. So that helps to pay down the capital cost of the overall infrastructure. Again, keeping an eye on the, the final delivered price uh, for the consumers. And then finally, authorization for ADA to go out to the bond market uh, to secure an additional $150 million uh, through the issuance of bonds that could then be used for financing uh, the overall in part, parts of the overall infrastructure also. Uh, two other important things here, we're definitely working with uh, municipal utilities or uh, uh, yeah, utility here in Interior Alaska that was formed by the local governments and then also uh, the, the governor was very interested in keeping a component of private sector investment. This wasn't really an, an attempt to, for the state to, to step in, just sweep aside all of the, the private sector interests, but more a, a project to, to involve um, private sector investment, knowing that uh, the state dollars were not going to be enough to complete all of the required infrastructure, so we wanted to try and stretch those dollars by partnering with a, a private investor. Uh, again, this is just sort of a, a further breakdown of those different components on the uh, in the entire production and delivery uh, scheme. You can see, you know, the feed gas. So there's a gas supply contract up on the north slope. Then you've got your LNG production. That's the plant on the north slope. 
you've got the transportation component, you've got a storage component and regas, and then finally the utilities that put the gas in the pipeline uh, in the streets, delivering it to individual homes here. And keeping an eye on all the moving parts and all the required contracts in all those different moving parts has, has been quite a task for, to Ada, for Ada to take uh, on. And then we, you can take those different components and sort of regroup them. You've got the, the infrastructure to deliver the product to the interior. That's these three components. Then you've got the infrastructure within the, the local community to receive the product and then put the pro get the product distributed uh, to the final consumer. Uh, this is a, just a graph to indicate that um, as you work on each one of those components, and in particular the LNG plant or the, uh, the distribution infrastructure, all of you, again, that, that work individual capital projects, you know that as you ref refine your engineering and you actually get to uh, you know, firm dollar commitments for components, um, that you're getting ready to actually issue um, RFPs for securing the components, the more you can refine that engineering, the, 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 the more you can shrink that band of uncertainty on what the, the final uh, price of building the plant is, is going to be. And what Ada has uh, decided they have to do is push this project a little bit further because this band of uncertainty out here when they are trying to uh, estimate what the cost of the plant is going to be so that they can tell the utilities in the interior who are going to be the customers for the plant what the, the possible deliver price is going to be, the further they can push that, that engineering along this line, the more uh, specificity they can give to the utilities on what the potential for the delivered price is going to be. And really, uh, for this, pri this plant on the North Slope, initially, certainly, there's going to be three customers. That is um, Golden Valley, uh, who can use a, a large quantity of the resource to spin the turbine out North Pole. Fairbanks Natural Gas, which has a very limited distribution system here in the core of, of Fairbanks right now, and the Interior Gas Utility, which is was selected by the RCA to be the gas distribution system in sort of the outlying North Pole uh, and area sort of surrounding that, that core area of Fairbanks. Now, when the governor introduced his, his package, um, he wanted to make sure that it, it was labeled. It wasn't the Fairbanks natural gas uh, you know, project, it's interior natural gas, uh, the interior energy project. And his vision was that although the core demand in Fairbanks is what justifies the, the initial construction of the plant, once you get that product flowing, because there is this core demand in Fairbanks, then the product is, is available uh, for very clever minds to figure out how we can use it further down the highway system, potentially on, on some of the uh, rural communities that, that might be able to take delivery ultimately on the river system. And another component is that the gas stream, the raw gas stream up the North Slope does have a very small propane component. The larger you can get the LNG production in the plant, then you can start to separate out those um, propane molecules and there could be then a, a potential propane stream that would be more um, easily handled, handled for rural delivery. But uh, again, Fairbanks is sort of the core, but the focus was that this would be a potential energy resource for a geographic area much larger than just the Fairbanks North Star Borough. And certainly, uh, as LNG is delivered into uh, to Fairbanks, there is the potential then for every 10th trailer or every 15th trailer to just continue down the highway, uh, perhaps delivering uh, LNG to Glen Allen or Toke, where you, you would have a, a power generator uh, that could be sort of the core uh, demand in that community to sort of anchor delivery of LNG into that community uh, for power generation, uh, possible capture of waste heat that could be used in the, in the community, uh, and then maybe some small scale delivery through a pipe distribution. That's all possible over time, but until you get the product actually produced and you start to get it flowing, those things can't happen. And so that's why you know, the initial focus is on Fairbanks because it's that core demand, uh, but the project is to deliver a, a new resource uh, potentially for use in a much larger geographic area. Uh, this, uh, just to give you uh, some of the, an idea of some of the progress to date, we are at 
participating with entities uh, to refine the financial structure. So again, we can figure out the optimum way of using those finance tools. You know, do you invest all your, your general fund capital dollars in the plant uh, and leave financing for all the other components? Uh, how much uh, can you finance the plant up in the North Slope? How much private sector capital can you invest in there so you can keep some of your, 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 your better dollars for use in the distribution system? Uh, Ada's playing quite the, the seesaw game, trying to figure out um, exactly where to put all of those dollars, how to spread those dollars uh, so that we can um, make sure that the, the price is down as low as possible uh, so we can actually get the infrastructure constructed. And uh, the efforts include, again, you've got the, the focus on the plant, the trucking, the distribution, uh, and Ada is, is spending some of those dollars to refine that, that engineering cost. Uh, to date, uh, some of the things that, uh, that have actually happened, and I, and I know in, in Fairbanks in particular, having lived here all my life, we have been looking to that uh, natural gas resource on the North Slope for such a long time. There's a healthy degree of skepticism that, well, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. But there are actually things that are happening here in the community and things that are happening up on the North Slope. If you're going to build a plant, you have to have a place to put the plant. And the, the gravel pad up on the North Slope has been completed. That was completed uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, that, that gravel pad needs to season. Uh, before you can actually uh, put uh, the pad or put uh, infrastructure on it in the next construction season. Uh, in addition, Ada has out of their general uh, investment funds, they have uh, agreed to loan money to FNG, the current small scale delivery system here in Fairbanks, to size up their storage. Can you can't you can't use LNG and unless you have a a facility to receive that cryogenic uh, super cold uh, liquid and the existing storage is not large enough uh, to, uh, to receive that. So uh, FNG has a plan to build a 5.2 million gallon tank and they have secured uh, ADA and local uh, bank financing for that. They've also, uh, ADA has also issued $15 million to FNG to build out their pipe distribution system in anticipation of a larger resource uh, being available for distribution. Currently FNG sources a, uh, up to about one BCF of gas out of an LNG plant that is down in the Matsu area fed by Cook Inlet gas. And so uh, we want to expand that distribution system so that we can hook up as many customers as possible when the resource uh, becomes available. They have also provided financing to IGU, that uh, municipally owned uh, utility for the outlying areas within the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Um, and uh, they provided $8.1 million for that. And, and IGU is using that money to further refine their, their, the engineering on their distribution system so they can get a much better idea of what the price will be for, to the uh, final residential consumer. Uh, FNG has put their $15 million uh, to very good use. Uh, this year they have um, uh, put a lot of additional pipe in the streets. They had a target of uh, up to 30 miles, and I can tell you that by the time they wrap up the season here in the, in the next week or two, they will have exceeded that 30 miles of, of new pipe uh, being put into the streets. Uh, the private sector um, firm that was selected to be the partner in the North Slope plant is MWH, and uh, they are now working uh, with the utilities that will be their customers uh, to negotiate with, with them on what volumes those utilities will need. And again, all of you that, uh, that deal in energy, you know energy is a volume enterprise. Uh, the more units of energy you can, you can sell, the further you can spread or the thinner you can spread those fixed costs, and that brings down the, the per unit price uh, for all your consumers. And so uh, MWH being involved in the plant, uh, they're, they're interested in having the largest volume present itself as quickly as possible, and they're negotiating with the utilities right now. Uh, Ada may also uh, has been encouraging those utilities that need to have that product trucked into the uh, interior. They're encouraging the utilities to work together again to sort of aggregate that that um, that trucking component to try and manage the cost of that component uh, down as low as possible. Uh, FNG, as I mentioned, their uh, build out is, is underway. And at this point, um, the trying to refine that uh, the engineering on the expected cost on the plant, 
Uh, we hope to have that pushed to sort of a phase one level of, of engineering so that we can really narrow the band of uncertainty on the delivered price out of the plant on the North Slope um, by the middle of November. So we are expecting a lot of that data on the refinement of the uh, cost components of the plant to be delivered to the board uh, sometime in early November. Uh, this just a, uh, wrapping up with a couple pictures. This is the uh, placement of the gravel up on the North Slope plant, uh, the final smoothing of the gravel so that that, uh, that uh, pad can season over the coming winter. Uh, this is the F&G effort here in uh, the interior. You can see some of the pipe is just being laid uh, by trenching. They've also done quite a bit of directional drilling. Uh, I know a couple weeks ago in sort of the, the area of Fairbanks that I live in, they were doing another drill under the Chena River uh, and were successful after two days of pulling through uh, another eight-inch uh, segment of pipe so they have another means of, of getting gas across the river. Here's some more trenching. And so they, they really have uh, worked very hard through a, a fairly soggy high water table uh, season getting as much pipe in the ground as possible. Uh, this is just to give you an idea in the IGU area. Uh, the, the map down here, see, we're down on the, the bottom is the sort of the core of North Pole where they would have phase, phase one, phase two. Golden Valley and Golden Valley's industrial demand would be out in that phase and then their plan is to build their system uh, starting in that, that core North Pole area. Again, going for initial um, bulk usage and then expanding out there, hooking up as many customers as they can, as quickly as they can. And this is just gives you an idea, the sort of shaded dark area in the middle of this horseshoe is Fairbanks, that's where FNG has their service territory, and then IGU is focused on sort of delivering to that horseshoe that goes around the core of Fairbanks. Uh, IGU, while they are doing a lot of the design of their expected distribution system, they actually have also been out in the field this year. Uh, so residences out in that core North Pole area uh, have started to see some activity actually on the ground. They're mapping wet, uh, wetlands and the sloughs out in the North Pole area and then doing some drilling to get an idea that as they drill, on, do directional drilling under the sloughs, how deep will they have to go. And that wraps up my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. Um, <clears throat> our, our next speaker is Commissioner Joe Baelish, and I, I was real uh, happy that Joe was able to work uh, through a very busy schedule and join us today to talk, talk to us about the um, um, AKLNG project. Um, I noticed today, actually, in his biography, um, one year ago today, he was uh, appointed as acting commissioner of DNR. So in many respects, he's here with us on his anniversary date. So um, he was, uh, effect he was uh, appointed to, um, commissioner in uh, November of 2013. Um, Joe has a uh, bachelor's degree in pol political science and government from Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon. Um, he grew up in the Air Force and graduated from Ben Ileson High School. Uh, so he is a, he is a, a, local, a local guy. Um, one thing I did... Um, a fun fact I learned about Joe this last uh, uh, legislative session when, uh, when the legislature was uh, um, confirming him as commissioner uh, was the fact that uh, he's, a, uh, he's a champion wrestler from high school. And in many respects, I, uh, for folks that um, is, you know, follow any wrestling, I think the strategies and the skills that he's developed as a wrestler um, has has probably become in very handy and has made him a very effective uh, commissioner of DNR. And so please um, help me welcome uh, Commissioner Baylash. Well, good morning. Um, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. She left out a couple things um, that I think might be a little relevant. We saw earlier Ms. George talk about uh, Ms. Bessie and all the hats she wears in Minto, 45 of them probably, right? And, and it just goes to tell you how small um, our town is, Alaska. I mean, we really are one big, small town. And it's a community that we all belong to and we all take pride in. And, um, and just to illustrate how small that community is, 
16 years ago today, I was uh, in college and looking to do an internship. Um, actually had my eye on working in uh, Ted Stevens' office back in D.C. But uh, as it turned out, um, there was a, a gentleman who uh, went to the same church as my, my family out in North Pole, and uh, my dad knew him, um, couldn't pronounce his name right, still can't. Um, and he was the local legislator, and, uh, and, and the staff that was working for, for uh, then Representative Terrio was uh, uh, Sarah Fisher um, prior to her marriage. And, uh, and so it was about this time, 16 years ago, that she and I were on the phone talking about me coming to work in his office. And uh, so for those of you who already know me and have a bone to pick, you've got one to pick with these two as well. <laughs> Um, Jean mentioned earlier in the conversation here just how um, skeptical people are about getting natural gas into this community. And when we talk about commercializing North Slope gas, all Alaskans are equally skeptical. And for a lot of reasons, good and bad, um, it's been a project that people have been waiting and waiting and waiting for uh, for a lot of years. But in my estimation, what we're talking about is a project that is so big, the investments are so large and concentrated in one project that they take on a, a, a different kind of risk uh, profile for all involved that it's going to take a lot to make it happen. And, uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are in our efforts to commercialize North Slope gas, working on the AKLNG project. Um, but I, I really think about it in terms of a giant boulder. And, and the thing is, once you get that boulder moving, the most important thing is to maintain the momentum, because if it stops, good luck getting it started again. Uh, it's it's going to take an awful lot, and, and you're going to hear me say a few things about alignment. Getting everybody pushing in the same direction to make something happen is really important. And, and I think we've made a lot of progress, and, and this progress isn't new. It's, it's an effort that started some time ago, um, and, and we have, I think, in some ways deliberately understated some of those achievements because of that fatigue that exists out there amongst Alaskans. So hopefully uh, what I'll be able to show you here will illustrate some of the, uh, the very real progress that's been made to date and why I, as an Alaskan, am so optimistic about the prospects of this project becoming a reality and, and really securing for us a future that uh, we all can enjoy. So I only have a handful of slides here. I really want to just talk a little bit so that we can hurry up and get to the Q&A part. I find that, uh, especially in audiences like this, it, it's important to uh, really allow you to ask questions to make it more relevant to the things that, that you're interested in. But what we have here is just a, a laundry list, if you will, of the benefits that commercialization of this huge natural resource we have on the North Slope at Prudhoe Bay and Point Thompson will mean. Number one, it's going to mean an opportunity for competitively priced and reliable energy. Uh, and that's you know, going to be true, particularly through uh, the route of the project that expands from the North Slope down to, to uh, Kenai Nikiski area. But it also, if it's large enough, will commercialize, basically allow the sale of LNG and export markets to provide a revenue source for the general fund treasury. And you know, for those of you who were here earlier in the week and heard um, uh, Mr. Moeller from the governor's office talk about our situation with oil production and revenues there, you know that we have an issue over the horizon that needs to be addressed, and that's our revenue picture. Commercializing North Slope gas is not going to be the boom that oil was for this state, but we're still talking a very significant increment of additional revenue, somewhere in the three to four billion dollar range, which by that time 
we're absolutely going to need as a state. The opportunities for Alaskans to participate in the construction of the project, to be employed long term by operation of the infrastructure associated here, is also a key aspect of the project that is uh, going to deliver not just dollars to the Treasury, but opportunities for people here in Alaska to, to earn a living and raise their families. And then finally, once this infrastructure is in place, we're going to see an opportunity for the undiscovered resources on the North Slope to be commercialized. A lot of people out there know that we have a tremendous potential for natural gas on the North Slope. We think about the oil that is present up there that's already been produced and the billions of barrels left to produce, but the fact is, geologically, we have much more natural gas than we have oil. And if we can find a way to get the infrastructure in place for people to transport that gas to market, we're going to have an even better gas business than we've had an oil business. So those are the real key benefits for all of us as Alaskans from this project. But for many of you who are here because this is the Rural Energy Conference, you ask, okay, that's great for all of us, but what does it mean for my community? What does it mean for the uh, future of, of energy security in other communities that don't happen to be on the project route? And Sarah mentioned this um, in her intro, but uh, let's get synced up here. But in the enabling legislation that passed earlier this year, uh, the legislature established a fund to ensure that energy infrastructure is made available for those communities that don't have direct access to the AKLNG project. Um, when this enabling legislation passed, it built upon the overall strategy that the governor has, which is to take commensurate steps with the other parties uh, to advance this project. As the owner state, we are not going to take a risk that other parties are not prepared to take. That way we get to benefit the same way other parties benefit from the project's development. So as we take this stepwise approach, um, we've got some big decisions out of the legislature this past session, and we're going to be going back in the future with even bigger decisions. But the legislature gave us some homework to complete before we come back to them again in the future. One of those homework assignments went to AEA to identify the affordable energy infrastructure opportunities that are out there. A lot of work that AEA does is, is tailored to the needs of specific communities because I think many of you know, and it sometimes gets harder for people in the rail belt to understand, but Juno does not know best. Um, you know, the, the solutions for your communities to meet your energy needs are best coming from you, empowering communities and individuals to make decisions and take responsibility is really the, the way that we're going to make this all sustainable and be able to thrive in the future. So with that homework assignment, working with communities, you then have the question, well, who's going to pay for this infrastructure? How is it going to be a benefit at, at the, the individual level, the home heating bills, the, the power bills, and the opportunities for businesses to operate in otherwise remote locations. Well, um, the legislature established this fund that takes 20% of the uh, royalty revenues that are received after the deposits to the permanent fund are made and, uh, and diverts it into this fund. Now, um, the question is, how much will that be? And, and that's a really important question. I'll come back to it. But the important thing is, once it's there, it's available to be appropriated through the, the AEA to finance this other infrastructure. Again, for those communities that don't have direct access to the AKLNG project. You can see from the map here, we've got a, a slice of, of the state here coming from the North Slope all the way down here to the anticipated 
site of the liquefaction plant in Nikiski, you know, it's it's all through throughout the rail belt there. Um, but there are, believe it or not, actually communities in the rail belt, especially in South Central, that actually don't have access to natural gas. You've got parts of the the Susitna Valley up in Talkeetna and and uh, and and uh, Trapper Creek, those kinds of places that NSTAR doesn't reach today. Um, you've got uh, in Southeast, fairly large city, Juneau, doesn't have natural gas today. So it, it's not just our villages, but other parts of the state as well that all would sure like to have the benefit of a cleaner, more affordable and more stably priced energy source and, and that's really what we're trying and hoping to achieve with the realization of this project. So, with that said, how much are we talking about? When we went back and, and evaluated all of the, the potential options for how to maximize our royalty interests, our production tax interests, we landed on we had to look at a whole number of, of issues and how to finance our share of the infrastructure and, and it kicks out a, a royalty figure for us and um, and as we estimate it and project it we're talking about the price of oil and gas in 2024 um, we see a, uh, a return on our royalty that comes in somewhere around 1.7 billion dollars as you go through all the permanent fund deposits and, and everything else, where we think this 20% figure winds up is somewhere in the 180 to $200 million range annually. So I think many of you know how much has been achieved with the uh, Renewable Energy Fund that today gets about $25 million a year. Multiply that times eight. That's what would be available to um, provide for infrastructure throughout the state. Now, that only happens if we maintain the momentum and we make the big decisions as Alaskans that are necessary for this project to advance. So, is it going to advance? Well, um, that's a really important question and, and we want to talk about now the, the progress that's been made. Because, as I said, it's not something that's new. It's not something that just happened, you know, in an election year, but actually got started back in 2012 with the resolution of a dispute between the state and lessees at Point Thompson. And the key to that particular resolution was identifying Point Thompson as a cornerstone of commercialization of nat natural gas on the North Slope. And we got secured commitments from the working interest owners to move that field into production. It had been discovered in 1979 and had not produced any oil or gas in that intervening time. That's why we were in court. So in, in resolving that litigation, the working interest owners had to commit to bring that field into production. <coughs> There are literally hundreds of people at work today at Point Thompson installing the infrastructure. A pipeline's been constructed, and next year the, uh, the, the larger production facilities are going to be moved in and installed. Um, with that, we saw the uh, very clear statements and commitments to using this field as part of the development of a, a North Slope natural gas project. And, you know, the, the uh, sponsors, ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, BP, and TransCanada all came together to identify, okay, here is the project. They came together in a formal way, a legal, legally binding way, to identify the project, identify um, the, the key components, put together a cost estimate, and, and start to advance things. So then we get to 2013. And there were some steps that the state of Alaska took. One of those was the legislature established the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation. That corporate entity is able to carry the state's interest in a project because it can operate and function very differently than a state agency. 
state agencies operate on behalf of the public. We make decisions um, that have to be transparent. And, and there has to be a, a lot of uh, check and balance on the processes that we go through in, in stewarding the state's resources and, and other government powers. That doesn't work very well in a business setting. That's why we have ADA and AEA in the first place, is, is to focus on, on certain key things that you wouldn't do with a, a typical government agency. That's what AGDC does for us on the gas side, is, is function in that corporate space, that business space, um, to ensure that we can have a seat at the table in these business decisions that are going on um, so that, that we can advance the, the state's long-term prospects. Um, the project announced in 2013 that the destination they would be working towards is in Nikiski. Uh, that settled the, the question about the direction that the project would go, whether to Cook Inlet or, or over to uh, Prince William Sound. Um, and then we at DNR in particular engaged uh, a, a large firm, Black & Beach, a world-class engineering firm that also has a business, com business strategy component involved, um, to identify what options we had to either maximize our value as, as the resource owner in the royalty context, um, or to otherwise ensure that the project uh, advanced. And, and that royalty study examined a whole bunch of options. We looked at ways to reduce taxes, waive taxes, defer taxes. And what we found at the end of the day was, you know, we didn't need to do that. We didn't need to give up our tax value in order to realize royalty value. That in fact, by taking an equity position in the project, we could in, in actuality increase our share of the revenue coming off the project and return that to Alaskans in the general fund and, and in the permanent fund. So, um, so with all of that information that came back to us in that study, we were able to, in very early um, 2014, agree with all of the other sponsor entities on a path forward called a heads of agreement. And in that heads of agreement, we provided a roadmap for legislators and the public to see how it is the project will be advanced, what the phases would be, what um, what the the big broad terms of of uh, our participation would look like, and and that in fact yes, the state would would assume a twenty five percent interest overall in the project. So. In order for that to actually come together in a more binding way, we needed certain statutes changed. And, and that's where SB 138 came into the picture. Um, there were a number of, of powers that DNR needed to have, that the Department of Revenue needed to have. The legislature, by the Constitution, is the only entity that can set taxes um, from the state side. So they needed to set a production tax. They did that. and. There were a lot of people very skeptical in January as to whether or not we were going to get this momentous piece of legislation through in an election year. We all know how, uh, you know, thanks to this U.S. Senate election, just how ugly things can get and, and people can dig in, get in their trenches and, and refuse to do anything. Well, the fact of the matter is, not only did the legislation pass, when you add up the votes in the House and the Senate, it was 52 to 8. That means a large number of Democrats voted yes. I'm pretty sure almost all of the Republicans voted yes. And, and from my standpoint as an Alaskan, thank goodness. Because the last thing we need to do is cloud this particular project with politics. This project is the key to securing a generation or more of Alaska's future. So the fact that we got that kind of support, that kind of, of uh, momentum as Alaskans speaking with one voice made a huge difference. It made a difference in the speed 
with which the other parties took action. And so we've seen since, uh, since that legislation passed uh, some additional progress. At the end of June, a joint venture agreement was signed, you know, taking that HOA, which was relatively non-binding agreement, and formalizing a number of, of things in a, a, a specific way. And um, since that agreement was signed at the end of June, we've seen the project come together. They're no longer employees that work for ExxonMobil or employees that work for BP. They are employees of this venture agreement, this, this venture. We're all together in this project. Those employees are all being paid by the relative shares of the project owners, and Alaskans have 25%. Since that agreement was signed, an application was filed with the Department of Energy, an application that allows us to export LNG from Alaska, and and that application is actually pretty impressive. If, if you go to DOE's website, you can find a copy of it. It's more than 200 pages. It's got uh, additional studies that examine the economic benefits to the state and the nation. It takes a look at the impact of the project on in-state energy prices and the long-term uh, impact of those, those uh, energy prices. So um, we then saw in August, the pre-file um, paperwork submitted to FERC, which allows the NEPA process to start, which is a critical step in the progression of this project. And then finally, um, just, uh, well, about 10 days ago, I returned from Asia, uh, went to Japan, China, Korea, to talk to the buyers of LNG who at the end of the day, we're going to need in order for this project to all come together. And the fact of the matter is, they know about Alaska. They know about Alaska LNG, and they want it. We're closer. We're stable. Today, Japan buys a lot of its gas from Qatar in the Middle East. They don't like that so much. Uh, they buy a lot of gas from Russia. They don't like that so much. So. Uh, the opportunity for Alaska's gas to displace these other sources when their other, other older contracts run out is there. It's real. And, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to going back, I think, um, uh, next in early November for uh, a, a, a big annual conference that's put on over there for buyers and producers to come together and, and talk. So. I think, uh, again, you've, you've heard me say I'm, I'm quite uh, bullish on the, uh, the progress. Um, you can see here we've got an excerpt from uh, Secretary Moniz. The um, Alaska LNG project is being treated differently in the regulatory uh, processes that DOE goes through when deciding who can export natural gas from the United States. And we think that uh, that bodes well for a quick decision. The, the application itself was noticed in the Federal Register last week. The comment period ends in the middle of October. And once that's over, hopefully, we'll see a, a fairly quick decision. And if we get that, that uh, export license in hand, then we'll know we can sell LNG to these overseas buyers. And that's when we can start to really assess the, the uh, viability and, and commercial returns that the project would generate for us as, as owners of the project. So we think, uh, we think a lot has happened. There's certainly a lot more to go. But um, we're looking forward to uh, continuing that momentum on behalf of Alaskans. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time for, for questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. I, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Balash, uh, you know, the D Department of Natural Resources is probably one of the most important um, departments uh, in a uh, in a state such as Alaska. And I think Joe, uh, every time I hear him speak, he really demonstrates um, 
you know, what to, yeah, I think what folks have seen in him and what Governor Paul, Parnell saw in him to head up this important agency. So I really appreciate Joe uh, making his time available to come and give us that update. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit right now to um, talk a bit about hydropower, um, in particular the Susitna Watana project. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I just came back from uh, Washington, D.C., and I actually picked up a, a book. It's from the Advanced Energy Economy, and it's talking about advanced energy technologies for greenhouse gas uh, reduction. So this is a uh, this is a national publication, and it's from a national entity. And I was flipping through this, and I was really pleased to see what they said about hydroelectric power. These are things that I think we know as a state that's very important for power. But, but sometimes I think in the lower 48, for some reason, the hydropower is, sometimes has a, uh, um, you know, the stepchild of renewable resources type of of uh, reputation. Um, but what, what I was real pleased is a couple of things said in this about hydroelectric power. It uh, currently constitutes the largest and oldest source of renewable electricity in the United States. It produced 56% of renewable electricity in the U.S. in 2012 and 7% from all sources. Greenfield development, which the Susitna Watana project would be a greenfield development, um, is a for new hydropower is relatively expensive and involves a long regulatory approval process, which you'll hear, hear more from Wayne with respect to where we're at with that. However, and this is, this is very important, these plants have a very long, useful life, longer than other types of power plants, and have power costs that are among the lowest available, owing to the low operating costs and the ability to recover capital costs over long time periods. Um, that's really, it. in a nutshell, that's why I think many of you who are lucky enough to have hydropower in your communities understand the value of that. We've uh, been past AEA and current AEA have been very excited about participating and helping to develop renewable projects in many communities. Um, so um, I think it's, um, it's good to hear about um, a bit of the, um, hear about the uh, larger project that we're pursuing um, in the rail belt. And here to talk about that is uh, Wayne Dyack. Wayne's uh, been with AEA since uh, 2012. Um, he actually worked for the old Alaska Power Authority on the Susitna project um, in the 80s. So in some respects, he's come back to finish, finish his work. Um, so, um, but one thing I wanted to let folks know about Wayne is uh, he is on the board of directors for the National Hydropower Association, and that's not just for um, pers perspective on the Susitna Watana project. Um, he really represents um, Alaska and AEA's um, um, interest uh, with respect to uh, hydro development on a bit of a, of a national level. So if any of you have questions with respect to a FERC process, he has over 35 years of experience on that. Um, he is, uh, if any of you have talked to Wayne, he is extremely passionate about his, um, um, his topic, about this project and just hydropower development in general. So um, please help me welcome uh, Wayne here. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. As I was looking at my, uh, my watch, uh, I was thinking, hmm, time for questions and answers. They got the wrong guy here to <laughs> back clean up for that. But I'll try to get through as, uh, as quickly as I, as I can. I know I've got a pretty savvy group here, so maybe I can go a little bit uh, uh, faster on some of the slides. So uh, I guess the first question is, you know, wh you know why hydro and why Susitna with time in particular? We've got around 50 hydro projects in the in in the state, um, in within the rail belt. Uh, you know, three significant you know projects. Uh, uh, the Power Authority is the uh, licensee for, or the Energy Authority is a licensee for for Bradley Lake, and there's a Klutna, uh Cooper Lake, uh, and Bradley has about four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So that speaks to uh, you know long term value of hydro right there. But uh, within the rail belt, 80 percent of the state. Uh, during construction, of course, you're going to have uh, quite a few jobs uh, available. And we've heard things like stable, reliable, 100 years plus. We've had over 100 years of uh, hydro experience, uh, um, you know, long-term, you know, diversification. I think that's a really important uh, thing. Right now, in uh, the Anchorage area, natural gas is the, is the primary driver. It's always good to diversify your, your portfolio. Uh, this is a renewable energy conference uh, or uh, rural energy conference here. Uh, so we all know that uh, 
there's a 50% renewable energy goal uh, within the state. Certainly, this uh, hydro would help us uh, get there. And we do want to, you know, we do know that fossil fuels are a key component. Uh, you know, certainly Gene and Commissioner, you know, Bill Ash talked about that. So we want to make sure that we, you know, maximize the value of those, uh, you know, fossil fuels. And then we've heard uh, the word affordable. Sarah had mentioned that. In her remarks, that's uh, you know really pivotal, uh, pivotal for us, and uh, it does help with the PC. So from a rural perspective, it does, uh, it will help, and it will help keep the cost of goods and services uh, you know down. Uh, I just want to hit this affordable thing you know one one more time because if you don't have affordable energy, as I've heard in several of the presentations over the past couple of days. You're at a huge disadvantage to have in uh, uh, a vibrant economy, whether it's a local economy or a statewide economy. So we do need that, and having you know low cost power does help to attract uh, you know industry. And I think, oops, went too fast here. So uh, this slide will uh, will will uh, you know demonstrate that in a second. <clears throat> if you look at those places that have uh, you know low cost uh, energy. I don't know if you can read from you know back there, but on the left is uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and then right beside that is Seattle. Seattle has 92% of their uh, energy coming from hydro, primarily their boundary um, you know dam project, and and it's allowing them to have you know low cost uh, energy. And as you go through and you see where there's less and less uh, you know hydro, the costs get uh, a little bit higher. So in New York, it's 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 interesting. They have a couple of very large uh, hydro projects. St. Lawrence, which is a 900 megawatt product, and Niagara, which is a couple of thousand uh, you know, megawatts. And those products have been in operation since the 1960s, and their cost is about two cents a kilowatt hour. So that's pretty amazing. That's what it was in the 60s, and in 2013, it was still two cents a kilowatt hour. Pretty amazing. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that helps keep that overall average low. You can see it's actually high because they have other uh, needs there. Very important thing. Um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, air quality and what hydro offers, uh, it's, an, it's a, a very clean uh, renewable resource. And we've uh, you know, run some uh, numbers through our ProMod model, which actually models every single uh, generation unit in the system. And that ProMod model showed that we would uh, displace relative to the without Susitna. Uh, you know, case if, if we had to sit on line 1.3 million, you know, tons of CO2 annually. Well, what is that equivalent to? That's equivalent to almost a quarter million passenger cars and the pollution uh, associated with that. Pretty significant. And if you and, and if you use EPA's numbers, it's actually 1.9 million tons. But that's because here in Alaska, we actually produce uh, you know less CO2 per kilowatt hour than they do on an average in the lower 48. So just a couple of uh, attributes of the, of, of the project. I know many of you are probably pretty familiar with the Susitna Watana project that's been around for a while, but a couple of uh, you know, key, key points here. So <clears throat> it's right up here, and it's about 87 river miles upstream of, uh, of, of Talkeetna. And there's some rapids here called Devil's Canyon. It's about 22 miles upstream of the uh, start of the, of, of the rapids, and that's significant. So the project... Focus on this number, 2.8 million um, uh, megawatt hours a year would be you know, generated by this product. And that's about half of what we use in the rail belt uh, today. And that's really the key. And we've got 61 years of flow data to really verify that number. So we're pretty confident on, uh, on that number. Uh, the dam itself would be about 700 you know, feet high. <clears throat> and the cost, certainly like any other... A uh, large product is not insignificant. It's over five billion dollars. This is a picture of what the you know, dam would look like. Uh, it's amazing what you can do with uh, modern technology. This is about two miles, uh, you know, downriver, looking up, and we've placed the dam in there. And this would be in like an August time period when the reservoir is full. Okay, so where are we are in the licensing process? We're hoping to file our license application in 2016. And that's if uh, we can stay on, on, on schedule. In June, we filed what's called the initial study report, which was a 7,000-page document, and it summarizes the results of our first year of study. So we've conducted additional studies this year, and uh, we have very important meetings coming up uh, 
uh, in October called initial study report you know meetings and then next year we'll do the second year of study uh, then use that information to do the impact analysis file the application and then FERC does its uh, its review uh, the goal is to start construction in the 2019 you know time period and you know be operational in the uh, you know 2025 time period so just a little bit of uh, information on the on the on the field effort FERC approved 58 different uh, you know studies um, uh, last April, I guess February and April, they did it in batches, and so we've been out there, you know, working on those, you know, different studies. Last year we had uh, over 300 people out in the field working on them. This year, a couple of hundred people out in the field. Um, very significant, uh, you know, effort, uh, and I'm happy to report that most of the folks that are out in the field are from Alaska, and a fair amount of the funding that we had goes directly to Alaskan uh, businesses. This is a, an interesting slide, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned this year here, too. So let me frame this. We uh, have a couple of fish whales out there, and we, we uh, radio tag a number of fish. So this is not the total population. These are the number of fish that we radio tag. And uh, about 30 miles uh, upstream of uh, Talkeetna in the Susitna River is where we, uh, we capture these fish. And then we see where they go and, uh, and, and spawn. In 2012, we tagged 352. And you can see as they go you know, upstream, fewer and fewer of them stay within the, within the main stem. Actually, what we found, if you look at even the work that Fish and Game is doing down by the Yentna River, uh, that over 90%, in the t and I think if you looked at Fish and Game, 99% of the uh, adult you know, Chinook salmon, they spawn in tributaries to the Susitna River, not the Susitna River itself. But as the, as the salmon go upstream, they go into the, into the tributaries. So we don't have a lot of uh, you know, uh, Chinook salmon go upstream of, uh, of, the, of the dam site. And I'm just going to say this is you know, above Devil's Canyon. The first year we did the study, we had you know, uh, uh, 10 of the 352 go upstream. The second year, uh, three. And this year, we actually had only two. We tagged uh, 623 fish um, you know, this year. And we had two. Now that doesn't mean there was only two. Um, you know, last year we figured there were around 60 to 80 uh, Chinook salmon that went upstream of uh, of Devil's Canyon, and and I'll give you a number. Um, you know, Fish and Game through their work, they estimate that about 89,000 Chinook salmon that are greater than 50 you know centimeters in length made it upstream in the Susitna River. Uh, so out of those 89,000. Not very many make it upstream of Watana Dam, so that's pretty different than uh, what you see in some of the rivers in the in the lower 48, where uh, people are critical of, uh, of of hydro. We're very different here, uh, <clears throat> and this year we actually put uh, side scan sonar in the river right at the dam site, so we're able to count the actual numbers of salmon uh, that went up, and that's going to be released. Uh, uh, next week we're filing uh, a document with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission which will articulate the numbers of fish that actually uh, were counted this year. Okay, so this year we had limited budget, so we really focused on filling in uh, you know, data needs that we had, critical studies that we felt needed to be uh, continued, and then uh, uh, those studies that, uh, that required continuous efforts. So ICE processes, uh, we've looked at that in, in the uh, to save some time for, for questions, I won't really will not get into these you know too much. But uh, we're wrapping up water quality glacial. You're going to be hearing a little bit about climate change uh, a little later today. While we're doing our own little climate change study and how it affects glaciers, so that work was ongoing. Groundwater is a pretty important component, so we're focusing on uh, on groundwater because it does have a huge effect on uh, incubation of uh, of spawning salmon. Uh, we did a lot of work with uh, with fish. Fish seems to be one of the big things that we're uh, we're focusing in on. Uh, we're wrapping up our uh, salmon escapement study. I talked to you a little bit about the radio tagging, uh, but I think we've got great data. And there were five years of data from the 1980s. And if you plot the three years of uh, data that we have uh, in looking at the timing of the fish, and there's been very anomalous years, they plot almost right over top of uh, each other. So I would. Uh, 
say that from an adult, you know, salmon perspective, uh, irrespective of uh, conditions, there really haven't been any differences. Yes, there are differences in the numbers of fish. That's pretty evident. I think all of us know that. Um, so the real area of, uh, of focus that I think we need to uh, uh, be looking at are really how uh, overwintering is a, a potentially affecting uh, the, the anadromous and resident fish and then just on the downstream, how the, uh, the flows affect the habitat. And so we're doing a lot of habitat modeling on that. And this year we did some distribution and abundance work as well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I uh, want to thank uh, uh, Ms. George for her uh, photo of, uh, of ptarmigan, because one of the things that we uh, are doing this year is looking at uh, 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 radio uh, tracking of uh, moose, caribou, and, and ptarmigan. We've learned a lot of things. I'm going to digress for, for one second, because when I started um, on the project three years ago, I met with uh, some Atna elders, and I was explaining to them the studies that we were doing. And one of the elders looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, well, good luck with those ptarmigan. And I didn't know what he meant by that, but I sure do now. They're the toughest critters to find and put radio collars on, but we finally figured that out. <laughs> Uh, we have learned a lot from the moose and the caribou as well. Just a little tidbit. We had a very cold uh, uh, you know, spring you know, last year, and, uh, and it was really tough for the moose and the caribou. For the uh, radio tag moose, the ones that had, uh, had calves, we lost uh, something like 47% of the calves were lost within the, uh, within the first um, you know, month. And out of that, 78% of those you know, were lost within the, within the first week, primarily due to you know, predation. So we're, we're, this is a really great study for the project, but it has great side benefits. Um, and so we're con we continue those moose, caribou, and, 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 and ptarmigan studies. We're going to be wrapping them up. Um, we did a lot of work on geotechnical uh, um, uh, exploration at the site. This year we did angled uh, you know, drilling and that was to verify that the roller compacted concrete design uh, that we've selected is 100%. We were 99% sure. After this year's um, you know, geotechnical program, we'll be 100% sure. Uh, I haven't gotten all the results yet, but everything I heard from the folks at the site is that it's confirmed how good of a, uh, of a site this is for a, for a hydro dam. Uh, just uh, quickly on the economic you know, benefits, uh, we have run some preliminary uh, numbers. We also hired a firm called Public Financial Management, uh, which is uh, looking at that, and they, were, uh, they verified all of the numbers that, uh, that we had. So, uh, so our original uh, assumptions are valid. We'll be updating that in the next couple of months. And my last little slide here, so we can have a few minutes for, uh, for Q&A. Uh, everyone knows that the cost of uh, power is expensive at the very beginning for renewable projects. But guess what? It stays pretty constant, and in real terms, that goes down. I think some folks were talking about that yesterday. And we do know that inflation affects everything uh, that has a real true fuel component. Uh, so the capital cost of this is, uh, is uh, certainly not insignificant, but in the long term, these prices go down, and if you have hydro in the long term, it wins every single time. And people say, yes, this product is expensive, and I say, well, yes, it's expensive, but what's the alternative? When you look at the long term, uh, the alternative is more expensive. So I'll just uh, leave it at that, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I, we do actually have enough time for questions, and we do we have a scheduled half hour break after this. So, um, if folks want to eat into the little break a little bit, uh, we can certainly do that. So, um, are there any questions for our panelists? Got a question coming in. Yes, you can get the mic. I, uh, I appreciate. Um, a lot of the information that we have here, and I think uh, all these projects have uh, significant merit. Um, I'm a little concerned, though, uh, because it's very clear to me that with the political situation we have and with the recent Proposition 1 election, we're not going to have the money to do these things. Um, and I don't think SB 138 is going to help at all. Um, I would like to see some priority on these, and I think we ought to give renewables uh, a leg up, and we think we ought to give them a leg up because they're renewable, 
Um, but I'd like to see what you people think about how the hell we can do this with the political situation. We don't have enough money to finance these things. I think if you look at the financing package that was offered by uh, for the Interior Energy Project, um, there is a desire to not carry that entire load. You, you want to uh, provide some loan funds and you want to invite uh, private sector capital in. Uh, certainly, Commissioner Baylash indicated that we're partnering with the, the major producers up on the North Slope, so the state would be participating in its, its, for its share, but the expectation is that th those producers uh, that want to take that resource to market also uh, provide a lot of money. The, I think all of this infrastructure, uh, we hope, is, is long term. Um, you know, certainly the hydro, that's multi-generational, uh, pipeline infrastructure also uh, very long-term, so it lends itself to, uh, to long-term financing. For the, uh, in fact, I had a brief conversation the other day about, uh, about hydro in particular and about the state's ability. And I think the way to look at it is, as I said for myself, I live in a $300,000 house. When did my wife and I ever have $300,000 in our pocket to buy a house? We didn't. We financed it. And we were able to finance it over time so, so that that mortgage payment, that monthly mortgage payment, was less than what I would be paying for if I rented an apartment somewhere. And so that made sense to, to take advantage of that long-term financing. And so on most of this infrastructure, that's what the state is going to have to do. We're not looking to cash finance these things. Okay. we got time for one more. Dean? Who is that? <laughs> Earl. <laughs> Joe, Joe. Hi, Joe. It's good to see you. Uh, now, now, my question goes back, be because I'm being excited on, on the whole liquid natural gas, but us in rural Alaska, we, we don't have the infrastructure for, for the liquid natural gas. So, Joe, is there anything that we can do out here as we start to look at perhaps Fairbanks being able to do propane as well? Or, or doing something on there, is there anything my region can do to further this along? Because we still see propane as, as cheap as fast as most is for us. And how can we help you guys over here to realize your dream, knowing that we're going to be next in line? How, how do we do that? So the, uh, the timing for AKLNG is such that uh, we're looking at a, a sequential process, advancing through different investment gates where the decision that's been made so far is to fund the pre-feed effort that's about a 500 million dollar price tag for all of the parties so the state share of that is about 125 million dollars the next phase would occur probably in early 2016 and that's a two billion dollar decision so the state share that's about 500 million dollars um, if the feed phase results in federal permits and enabling the, uh, the, the project to make a final investment decision. We think that'll take place sometime in late 2018, early 2019. With about five, five and a half years of construction, we're looking at about a 2024 first gas opportunity. And that's a ways out there. So IEP, I think, is looking at a 2016 startup uh, time frame. So we're going to have different delivery systems and mechanisms in place sooner than AKLNG. And, and I think with, despite the momentum and my enthusiasm, um, AKLNG has some uncertainties. So I think near term for a lot of communities, focusing on these smaller opportunities is the way to go. And IEP isn't the only one. There are companies right now looking at uh, LNG plants in Cook Inlet. Um, in fact, I know of one operation that's been looking for a way to aggregate demand out in uh, the Dutch Harbor area because the processors need a lot of power in the summer and then the home heating and, and residential demand rises in the winter. So that's a good matchup of, of a demand profile to supply LNG out in that region. Um, LNG is something that will be available to coastal communities, but in COTS, you know, that it gets a little icy now and then. So it disrupts the ability to, uh, to deliver LNG by water um, all year long. 
So what do you have to do? You have to look at the cost of storage. How much can you deliver when the water is open? How much can you store and keep cold enough all winter long? Storage isn't cheap. So there is a trade-off, which is why in SB 138, the language was written broadly. It's not just LNG that would be shared with communities or that the funds could be used to finance infrastructure for. It may be that, again, Juno doesn't know best and there's not one answer for all of the energy needs in this state. So what is the right answer from an infrastructure perspective for each community, each region? And, and, uh, and that's what we need to look at longer term. But there are, there are nearer term opportunities that involve gas and whether it's North Slope or Cook Inlet. All right, can we have a round of applause for our panel, please?